Um, well, I am honored and grateful to get to do this. Um, and uh, just for you guys to, to get to get, know you guys, you guys have been very welcoming and um, encouraging to me. Um, of course, Randy, um, the big bearded guy, um, is doing well and our kids are doing well. And so it just means a lot to me as a mom to be embraced like that, but then as a person. So I wanna say thank you for that. Um, where we came, we were at a smaller church in Brock, Texas, which is just outside of Weatherford, Texas, if you're familiar with that area. And we were there from really the ground up. Um, we were there for about 13 years and um, got to see that thing just kind of come to life. And it was where some of our best friends were the pastor and his wife. And we got to be a part of that. And that was a really exciting thing. And God moved my heart from, uh, well, even further, I'll go back a little bit more, is in 25 years ago, which is terrifying to say that age, um, I was a youth intern um, under Jerry and Mary. And um, I lived with them the first after their first year of marriage. So if you have any questions, I can answer <laughs> uh, It was great. It was great. And, um, but I was a youth intern. Kelly was in my youth group. And, um, and so I've, I always, I've always had a heart for students. That's kind of my wheelhouse. Uh, obviously, I don't like kids. Little kids. So uh, that's always kind of been more of my wheelhouse. And so, but what's so neat is I, I, I was able to go do college work. I, I worked at OBU um, where I went to school and got to work there for a while. And so I kind of thought college and high school was kind of where I was going to land for a while. And what's so cool about where we were at the gathering, um, our other church, is God just kind of moved my face a little bit toward women. And, um, and so really the last, probably we were like there 13 years, probably the last five, I just got a real passion for women. And, and being able to not only just live life with each other, um, which I think is a big deal, um, but get to actually lead and, and be a part of that. So, um, so I was, uh, my husband had a big mouth and told Anne that I did that. And so I was like, slow your roll. Like I'm sitting for a while. Um, so, but I see it as such an honor to get to talk to you guys and, um, and, and get to share um, this time together. So let's pray and get this thing going. God, we just thank you that um, there's no other audience that is worthy. Um, there's no other person that is worthy but you. We thank you um, that you are a God of good things. You're a God of great things. And I just ask, Father, that you would hide me behind your cross. Um, I pray that your name would be adored, your name would be heard, and we give you all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, I was really excited when I got the passage that you see in front of you. And if you don't have your Bible memorized, which if you do, you should be up here teaching. But if you don't have that memorized, I have the passage that is the whole kangaroo court thing that Jesus goes through, which wasn't a little thing, and then I, the go before Pilate, and then Peter denies, and then he gets crucified. Yes! <laughs> like, I got that passage, and I was like, oh, that's awesome. So, I am, um, I mean, because that's heavy, right? That's heavy. Um, but, and so I, I, as Ann and I were talking, and I was praying about it, and, and I really felt like the Lord illuminated, I know he did, he illuminated three sections of this little passage um, of scripture that, honest to goodness, I, and I've, I was saved when I was eight, and really all I've ever, ever known is the Lord, praise God, but I, I, so I've read this story over and over and over again, and I really did not, have never really, these scriptures have never, these verses have never really been illuminated to me, so we're going to walk through these. And it's going to kind of kind of do it in three parts. I'm a daughter of a pastor who retired after 50 years. And so all I know is to do things in threes. And they usually all have the same letter. But tonight they don't. So I'm not that much. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't nerd out on you that much. But um, let me tell you, I, I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version. And I don't know if you are familiar with that version of the Bible. I'm a big advocate for when you're reading scripture to read it in different different versions and that's probably I hope that that's something that you're probably already doing um, thank goodness for the Bible app because it makes it real easy all I have to hit is a button you know and it changes it um, but a couple years ago Randy and I were able to um, life group pastor basically a life group there at our, our, our previous, church, previous church and he really got into the amplified version and so we really as a house church is what we were called there um, really started reading in that and it if you've never read in that version, it just, it literally does what it says. It amplifies it. And so if you are not a word person, if word 
words, a lot of words wear you out, don't read the Amplified version <laughs> because you'll go cross-eyed. Um, but I am a word girl. I love words. They're, they're big to me. And so I just love that it kind of gives us even bigger meaning as to what it's saying. So if you hear me saying other words when I'm reading these, it'll make sense that, that I'm, doing, I'm reading out of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this into three things. The first thing that we're going to talk about, and if you want to write this down, you can. It, 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 it's totally up to you. The first thing we're going to talk about is what is your story or what is our story? Okay, the big, the big, the big key there is story. Let's go to, and yes, I have to have readers, so I'm sorry. That's just what it is. Um, okay, I want you to go to Mark 14, and we're going to go, and, and I'm going to encourage you to, in your own time, in your own study, read this entire, read the entire passage that's in front of you, okay? Um, but we are going to camp out in just about three different sections. <clears throat> So I want us to start at Mark 14, verse 55. We're going to read several, several verses, and then we're going to talk about what is your story. So we're at 55. Now the chief priests and the entire council, which the council was the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court, were trying to obtain testimony against Jesus, which they could use to have him condemned and executed, but they were not finding any. And we're at 56. For many people were giving false testimony against him, but their testimonies were not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple, this sanctuary, that was made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Verse 59, Not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. And you guys, we know that part, if you're, if you're familiar with any part of the what we call the Easter story, right? Um, is that, you know, they had all these accusations against Jesus, and they couldn't, they couldn't come up with things, and they would come up with things, and then someone else would say something else. And I've read that before, but I had never honed in on that verse 59 that says, not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. Something about that word, the Holy Spirit brought up that word consistent, okay? And I started thinking about, okay, what's their testimony? What, what, do, what do we mean by their testimony? I mean, what are we talking about? So I started thinking, I did a word search on the word testimony, and, you, and I got all kinds of, you know, a, a, a declaration, an oath, that kind of thing. And I came upon the word affidavit, okay? This isn't full disclosure. I thought it was spelled Atha David. <laughs> it's not, in case you don't know that. Uh, <laughs> I was really impressed with that. Um, and I looked up the word, uh, what's an affidavit? Affidavit is a written, make sure I write that, yeah, written declaration upon oath, okay? When we hear the word affidavit, we think of court, right? We think of a testimony of someone having to give an affidavit, a written under oath, okay? That means that can't be perjure, it can't be perjurized, it, it has to be complete, right? It has to be consistent, right? We think about that. And that kind of got me thinking about all these eyewitnesses, quote, they were eyewitnesses to what Jesus was doing. And I started thinking about eyewitnesses. And when I think about eyewitnesses, I thought about, when, you know, a, an accident that happens. Usually what, what the, the, the policeman will do will come up and get everybody's story. About, it'll be a year ago in May, and I had my favorite car that I've ever driven, don't judge. It's a black Sienna, Toyota Sienna minivan. Okay? Any? Seriously, none. <laughs> okay, you hit a button and those, those doors came back. And when you have a, what do I have then? An eight, a two, and a one-year-old? Oh, that's golden, right? You just open and they get in. So I had my favorite car, um, and I'm coming back from an errand. We have an intersection in Weatherford that I don't know who made it, but it's absolutely crazy, okay? No, I mean, it's, it's dumb. And accidents happen there a lot. And we only lived about five minutes from this intersection. And I'm coming home. Praise God, the kids, the kids were not with me. I'm coming across an intersection and get completely T-boned, okay, in my beautiful Sienna minivan. But no kids, airbags, all the things, okay. And I remember when I spinned, it literally, he literally spinned me, and I looked up, and my light was green. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm not the crazy one that ran the red light. Um, turns out, so we get out, you know, and, and God put this this girl who was in this souped up, incredible Jeep with tattoos all over her, and she was my angel, and she had seen she had seen the whole thing. She came over, made sure we're okay, all this stuff. Well, the guy thought his light was green. It's that whole scenario, right? And I remember when the cop, when the cop came over to get my story, because again, we're getting eyewitness accounts, right? I give my story, and if you know anything about me, or if you get to know me, you'll learn I will take the blame on anything. Okay, anything. I, you put me right, I, I, will, I will take every single blank. Ask Randy Wood, because he's real good about blaming. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll take it. <laughs> and, um, and so she, he comes to me, and he's talking, and, and my little angel, my little tattooed angel over here, she, 
I, I said, you know, here's the deal. I'm pretty sure mine was green, da, da, da. And I said, but hey, if I'm wrong, I'll totally take it. And she goes, you will not. She was like, you, I was right behind me. I was like, okay, she's right. And uh, so anyway, but what a cop does, right, is gets different eyewitness accounts because he has to see, are they going to be consistent, right? And so I started thinking about that, and I started thinking about these people that, that, that they were trying to come to some agreement about how are we going to accuse this man so that, he will, so that he, we will get rid of him, right? And that made me start thinking, how many of times is our story not consistent? How many times do we live out this relationship with the Lord in front of people, and if they were to look at you and you and you and you and me, they would go, wait a second, those don't match up. And y'all, it was convicting to me. I mean, really, the, the Spirit, believe me, I, I, if I, I'm not one to step on toes. I'm stepping on my own because they, they all last week, the, the Holy Spirit was doing that. Is do I know why I believe in the name and the person of Jesus Christ? And is it consistent? If people look at my life, are they able to say, yeah, I watch, I watch what she does and it's consistent? Because I started thinking to a hurting and confused world, which do we live in a hurting and confused world? Yeah. I mean, they may be spinning out of angry control, but they're literally hurting and confused, right? To a hurting and confused world, we will not have an answer, an eyewitness account that is consistent if we aren't continually in intimacy with the Father. And y'all, that was convicting to me, is my intimacy with the Lord on a daily basis has to be there, or I literally will look like an inconsistent eyewitness to who Jesus is. And so I want to encourage you, and, and you know, and I, I've already been praying for you the past couple of days, that God will just, he will speak exactly what you need to hear in that, because I know all of ours will be different. But where is, where is maybe your story inconsistent? And is there an area of your life that you need to say, okay, I need to straighten that out so that the people who watch what I do get a very consistent eyewitness account to who Jesus is. All right? Okay, let's move to the second one. So what is our story? The second one is what is our tone? Tone. And you can even put tone of voice, however you want to do that. All right. I want us to move down to, let's go to, I think, we're going to stay in 14. Go down to 66. Yeah. Stay in 14 and go down to 66. <clears throat> While Peter, we know, and, and, and again, if you know anything of the story, this is going to sound very familiar, but several verses I'm glad I wore a hat and this classes. Um, several of these verses just popped out of me. 66, while Peter was down below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked intently at him and said, you are with Jesus the Nazarene too. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. Then he went out of the courtyard to the porch and a rooster crowed. 69, the servant girl saw him and began once more to tell the bystanders. Okay, so now there's people on the side, bystanders. This man is one of them. But again, he denied it, verse 70. After a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, you are in fact one of them, for it is clear from your accent that you are a Galilean too. I don't know about you, but I don't know what version you have, but I have never read a version where it actually said his accent sounded like a Galilean. His tone of voice and, and I started thinking about that. And, and we know, right, in different areas of the United States, we sound different, right? I mean, if you, anybody from the North? There you go. Um, you're a little exception to the rule. I don't think you sound so much. But I mean, there's some people from the North that you want to say, can you be kind in how you say that? Like, that was just rude, how people sometimes, you know, how, how sometimes they say that. And we have that whole Southern hospitality. We say things so kindly here. And, and so we know, but even in Texas, I've noticed there's different areas of Texas, where, and you can tell when people are from the rural or from the urban. And so we know what tone of voice sounds like. So think about from this, from their perspective, they heard what Peter was, how he was talking, not even just his face, and they said, "You sound just like him." All right. Well, that got me thinking about things that we say, and we know that actions are way more important, right? We know that actions, what we do, brings life to our words right? But let's think about where we are right now. <laughs> and I want you to think about how popular and how easy it is to act like a Christian right now. Think about it. How many things do we see outside of this church building or outside of your house that, that in, in secular areas of, of this town, of our, of our community, that say, be kind to your neighbor and wear a mask? Let's be kind. I can go to Target 
pay 10 bucks for a really cute shirt that has a rainbow on it and says, be kind. I guarantee every person that wears be kind is not a Bible-believing son of, you know, born-again believer, right? Because right now, it's pretty popular to be nice to our neighbor. It's really popular to do, have good deeds. And so I started thinking about the fact that it's gonna, the proof is going to have to be in how we sound. Because right now, man, everybody wants to be kind. Everyone wants to have that. I want to. I want to. I want to be nice. I want to. I want to show show hospitality to my neighbor. I want to check on my neighbor. All this kind of stuff. It's gonna. It's gonna come down to how do we sound, right? I, I had a chance to. Well, and, and, and I, I was thinking about how we sound. And sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes we need to speak the name of Jesus without saying his name. And I've been in situations where it's not it, right then. I can't say his name, but I'm, but I'm living that out in front of. But sometimes he opens the door. And I don't know if he's ever done this for you, where he's opened the door for an opportunity for you to throw in Jesus' name and actually say it. And this happened for me actually three days ago. I love how the Lord worked that right into this. Um, we, we went to, uh, me and Maggie, we have a four-year-old daughter. And she was invited to a birthday party. Um, and I'll be honest. Three o'clock on Sunday afternoon, I am usually vertical on my couch, falling asleep to a Hallmark Christmas movie, okay? Or a Hallmark movie, okay? That's just full disclosure. I, I don't enjoy being anywhere else on Sunday afternoon, but we're trying to be friendly and we're gonna go to this birthday party, right? So we go to this birthday party and I'm in conversation with one of Maggie's friend's moms, okay, at this birthday party. And we're just talking, she's from this area, so I'm like, we're new, you know. And we're, we, we live in an apartment, we do not live in the, in the RV anymore, in case anybody wondered that, we did upgrade a little bit. And, um, and so we're, we're trying to figure out where are we going to land, you know, that kind of thing. And so we're talking about this, and she asked me the question through this whole story, she asked me the question, so how did you guys decide, or how did it work out that you ended up at Franklin? Our kids go, our, my, our oldest, our 10-year-old and our 4-year-old, 6-year-old, go to Franklin Elementary. She said, how did that work out? And I said, well, and, and, I, and you know, of course, the Holy Spirit's like, this is it. This is it. This is where you're going to bring my name in. And what did I do? I just kind of told her a story, which basically, really, in December, we knew we were moving here. We were saying all of our horrible goodbyes, you know, <laughs> uprooting that and doing that. And Mary was really my only friend, okay? And, and she was. I've learned. I've gained other friends. Thank you for being my friend. Um, and, and so I'm talking to Mary, and I'm like, I don't, know, I don't care where we live. I don't care if Randy succeeds at this job. I need to know where my kids are going to school. Okay, let's just keep it real. I am not a homeschool mom. And, and I, I, I just, I, I was like, we are pro public school. That's where we really feel like we're supposed to be. And so she was like, hey, we go to Franklin. I was like, that sounds great. I like the name. That sounds really cute. <laughs> and, and so I just began praying into it and just really just saying, God, you're going to have to illuminate this because I have no idea. And there were no apartments. There were no, we could not find an apartment. Okay. So I finally, Mama bear it up and I'm like, we got to find an apartment. We find one. It's not going to be open until mid-January, hence the reason for the RV. And so and, and that apartment is in Franklin's district. Okay, so I tell that entire story to this, to this lady. And I had the opportunity to say, and it, no, here's how, here's how it went. She, she asked me, she said, so it all just kind of worked out. Pause. The Holy Spirit's like, this is it. <laughs> and I had a beautiful opportunity to slip in that beautiful, you know, I mean, I didn't have to be all Christianese, the providential thing of God, but I could have very easily just said something like, no, no, we really believe that God just placed us exactly where we're supposed to be. But what did I say? Yeah, it's worked out. When? And that's what I'm talking about. Sometimes, sometimes we don't have those opportunities. But man, when he opens that door for us to sound different, we need to take it. And that may mean you making somebody feel a little bit awkward that you talked about Jesus. But that's okay, right? <laughs> right? We're, we're seeing that that's going to be okay. All right, so do we sound different? And I'm telling you, I, I started thinking about to a tolerant, happy world, right? Everybody's accepting of everybody. Everybody's happy with, hey, you do you, boo. You do your thing, right? And I'm not going to, I'm going to be tolerant. But to a tolerant, happy world, we're not going to look any different if we don't sound different. If we don't say, have those opportunities to speak his name and do it even if it makes people feel awkward. And believe me, I, 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 listened, I listened very intently to the Spirit when he, when he reminded me of that. All right, last. So what is our story? What is our tone? What is our motivation? What is our motivation? We're going to move to 15. So move over to chapter 15. 
and go down, let's see, go down to about, let's start at about six. So chapter 15, verse six. Now at the Passover feast, Pilate used to set free, excuse me, for them, any one prisoner whom they requested. The man called Barabbas, with, who, the man called Barabbas was imprisoned with the insurrectionist who had committed murder in the civil rebellion. The crowd came up and began asking Pilate to do as he usually did for them. Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to set free for you the king of the Jews? And verse 10, For he was aware that the chief priest had turned Jesus over to him because of envy and resentment. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd and, to get him to release Barabbas for them instead. And again Pilate answered, Then what shall I do with him who you call the king of the Jews? They screamed, Crucify. But Pilate asked them, Why? What has he done that is evil? But they screamed all the more, Crucify him. Verse 15, so Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, set Barabbas free for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to his soldiers to be crucified. Specifically, verse 10 and 15 stuck out to me, okay, about when, we were, when I was thinking about motivation. And I was thinking about the word motivation, you know, and you know what that is. I'm really, I'm motivation high right now. Thinking about why people do something, okay. I mean, if there's like 15 of us, right, and we all make our beds every morning. Okay, let's say that. Let's say we all make our beds every morning. I guarantee of 15 of us that make our beds every morning, there'd be about seven different reasons why. Right? But we can all do the same action, but it's that, you know, that motivation I see as the, uh, you know, that just kind of push, right? That gets us to do it, right? I'm one of those weirdos that likes the Enneagram. Uh, I know. Um, and, and I've learned with the Enneagram, what they, what, they, what they find is with your different personalities, we're all different. But we can all do the same thing. My husband and I can do the exact same thing, but we are motivated by two completely different things. And I've always just found that pretty fascinating. So looking at this, at this, little pas at this passage, I started thinking about how motivation deals with our heart, right, and not the action. It, it, it's that part of us that why did we do it, right? And, and, I, and I, I was looking at that. I thought this was really interesting. Looking at those two, at verse 10 and verse 15. And we're talking about, in verse 10, we're talking about the chief priest. And these, these are the dudes that were the top of the top as far as religious, all right? And we know, quote, religious, right? It, we, we, you guys have studied that. You know I'm talking about San, the Sanhedrin and, and the Sir, Fer, Pharisees and the Sadducees, all the, all the, the chief priests, they were the top, right? And so, but what was their motivating factor? What does it say there in verse 10? Envy and resentment. Envy and resentment. And y'all, I honest to goodness, every other time I've ever read this passage, I just thought, you know, well, they're just jerks and they just got Jesus up there. No, it specifically said that. And who was it that figured that out? Pilate. Probably not a believer in Jesus, right? Pilate could see through their through what they were doing and knew that their motivation was envy and resentment. Well, I thought that was so interesting that I did a, like a little study on that. This is an incredible, I thought this quote was so cool. I found it under, it's a, it's called the pulpit commentary. It says, Envy was the passion that influenced the chief priests. They saw that Jesus was gaining a great and increasing influence over the people by three things. The sublime beauty of his character, the fame of his miracles, and the constraining power of his words. Think about that. Does that describe Jesus? The sublime beauty of his character, the famous miracles he was doing, and his words had power. And they saw this. They, the, the chief priests saw this. And they saw this unfolding. And they said, and hence, this in quoting, and hence they concluded that unless he was arrested in his course and put out of the way, their own influence would soon be gone. The whole world was going after him. Therefore, he must be destroyed. And man, I'm telling you, I knew that the chief priests, I knew they hated him. But man, when I read that, I thought, wow. They saw him for exactly the reason that you and I worship him, right? And they, and they said, huh. Why? Because they were motivated by envy and resentment. I don't know if you've ever heard this. I've, always, I've heard this before, that the, the difference between jealousy and envy, have you ever heard that? That jealousy is, I want what you have. I, 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 want, your, you know, I want your life. I want your husband. I want your kids. I want, I want what you have. You know what envy is? I don't want you to have what you have. It goes to that other level. We, we, we basically, are, <coughs> my mom um, had, a, had an incident happen about a couple years ago with her sister. 
and it, we, it illuminated some envy that my my aunt had had over my, my mom and her other and her other sister. And I saw it just unfold. Of you don't get to have what I can't have. And so I think about those chief priests, and I think how how motivated by that that they were moving in that direction, right? Let's look at Pilate. Pilate in verse. Let go down to fifteen. What was Pilate motivated by? To keep everybody happy so that he could continue to live. I've always thought Pilate, you know, Pilate, he's just a weasel, okay? I mean, I literally picture an actual weasel, okay? <laughs> if they did like a Veggie Tales, they should make a weasel. <laughs> he wouldn't be a vegetable, I guess. But, um, but, but I just picture this weasel of a coward, right? And we know that. We, we know the story of Pilate. I, I did a little bit more research about Pilate. We know that he was the Roman governor over Judea. Okay? So he was actually Roman, right? And he got put in charge of these crazy Jews. Okay? And he hated it. He ha- absolutely hated it. And he wasn't very popular with them for many reasons. One of the reasons he wasn't popular with the Jews was he made fun of their religion. Okay? Which is not going to get you very far with a bunch of people who love their religion, right? So he, he, he made fun of the religion and his administration, the people under him were full of corruption and absolute brutality. Think about it. If you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ and it's not something you sit down with a bowl of popcorn and just enjoy, okay? It's heart-wrenching, right? And I, I firmly believe every believer should watch it once a year because it just it just unearths that reminder of what, what, we, what we were given, right? But if you've ever watched that, and you watch that scene where they are scour- scourging, or scourging, I'm saying that right, um, Jesus, you see the brutality of those men, right? So he had, Pilate had, he made fun of their, their religion. He had people under him that were absolutely horrible, Right? And one other thing about Pilate that I didn't think I really had realized is, is he, what, he had fallen out of favor with the emperor. The emperor's name was emperor, the Emperor Tiberius. All right? And what's interesting is the dude... Okay, stay with me. It's kind of weird. The dude that put Pilate in charge, this guy's name was Sejanus. Sejanus, something like that. His name was Sejanus, okay? He put, he's the one who actually put Pilate in charge, okay? Sejanus, that, that guy got Tiberius, the emperor's son, killed, okay? And he had a plot to kill the emperor, the Sejanus guy. Now, Sejanus is the one who recommended Pilate to be put in this position. You talk about a bad recommendation. Because the emperor's basically like, uh, I'm going to constantly watch this Pilate guy because if he was recommended by the dude who wanted to take my life, that's not healthy, right? That's not healthy. Bad recommendation letter. Bad. And so Pilate has all, do you see all these little things that he's hated by the Jews. He has horrible people working under him. The emperor already has his eyes on him and, and wants to watch everything he does. So I found this quote from a, a, a commentator named Hope Bollinger. She said, An awful standing with Caesar, one more mistake, and Pilate could lose his position or very possibly his own life. Fearing for his life and social standing, Pilate relented to the crowd. So, you know, Pilate wasn't motivated just that he wanted everybody to be happy. Right? Everybody be peaceful, like the cute nines on the Enneagram. Like, they, he didn't really, he really didn't care about everybody's heart. <laughs> no, he wanted everybody to be happy because if he, everybody wasn't happy, he was losing his job and probably his life. So I know, I'm not looking at a bunch of women who are <laughs> the chief priests and Pilate. But what motivates you to follow Christ? Obviously, these, these people, these men, were motivated to hate him. And we see how completely wrong it was. Envy and resentment for who he was. Um, a, 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 a selfish standing for himself. But what motivates you to follow him? I'm not looking at a bunch of beautiful women who were, who were in the crowd yelling crucify. Right? But do we have, do we know what our motivation is to follow him? And I started thinking about where we, where we live. And like, I, like I was saying earlier, you know, it's real popular to, um, to, to, to be kind and to, to it's, it's popular to be a Christian, right? I have this funny, I, I've decided that on, what road is that? Do I drive Taft? Mm-hmm, I do. I drove Taft, I drive Taft every day by Midwestern. Is that on Midwestern? Is that, okay. Um, and I, so to take the kids to school, okay? And I call it Church Row. Well, there's like three churches. What is it, like Christian Church, Methodist Church, some, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I feel all good about myself when I'm a professor. Um, literally, we are in that place where we're in Tuesday night women's Bible study. It is great, and you feel really good about yourself when you walk your cute little kids into the cute, the nice little Awanas program. 
But girls, man, my toes were blistered from being stepped on by, by the Lord about this. I've, all I've ever known is the Lord since I was eight years old. I, I believe firmly that I was raised by two of the most godly and consistently godly people on the planet. I, I was given a very good picture of what Jesus looks like my entire life. And yet, many times I can get into this routine where I'm not motivated. Where my motivation is, well, my, my husband gets paid from those people and gives us something to do on Wednesday night. Let's go ahead and go. And y'all, I started thinking about to a mad world. We have a world who is spinning out of control in madness. They're pointing fingers. They're blaming. We know that. We've been living in it for, what, 13 months specifically. Our lack of motivation will not help us to always be ready to give the hope that we have. In 1 Peter 3.15, one of my favorite verses, the second part of 1 Peter 3.15 says, And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to give it. But girls, we won't if we don't have that motivation. If my only motivation, if, if, if I've been lulled to sleep with just everything I've ever done since I was 8 years old, every little program I've ever put my kids in, every little Sunday morning, this is what, this is what we do. But if my motivation isn't stirred up constantly, and how does it get stirred up? In daily communion with God. That's the only way. <laughs> that, and, and, and God knows what, uh, you know what that looks like for you. You know what that looks like for you. But that's the only way that that motivation will continue to be stirred up. So I want you to think about our story. How, why, what is it that, what is my story, and is it a consistent is, is it consistently telling people who Jesus is? Do I sound different? Do I, not, do I not use the same language? Do I not talk about the same things that everybody else talks about? Am I consistently throwing his name in there when I can? And is my motivation intact to where whenever someone looks at me and says, why did that happen? I can say it's by the blood of Jesus. Jesus, we just thank you, Father, that you are, um, you're the reason. And this story would have zero <laughs> uh, meaning, zero um, in, impact on our lives, if not for the sacrifice that you gave. We praise you for that realization that those men did not take your life. Praise God that you gave it. And I just pray that you stir within us as you stepped on my toes and you stirred my heart. I pray you do the same in these, these precious women. That our story, our tone, and our motivation would be consistent with walking with you on a daily basis. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Son. And we praise you, Holy Spirit. And in that precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 You guys are good.